1983, and this is the 3.30 meeting on Monday afternoon, the one and only Monday of our camp session together. Now, <clears throat> we're just working on this um, problem of uh, understanding what the battle will be during the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, I read the statement from Patriarchs and Proverbs, page 672. I want to read it again now to, because we just lost track of it during the interval period. Men cannot understand the ways of God, and looking at appearances, they interpret the trials and tests and provings that God permits to come upon them as things which are against them and which will only work their ruin. Thus, David looked on appearances and not at the promises of God. He doubted that he would ever come to the throne. Long trials had wearied his faith and exhausted his patience. In other words, um, while God was working to bring to David the kingdom, and while God was working through these trials and tribulations day by day to perfect in David the qualifications to be a successful king, David fought against God. He, he wrestled with God by seeing in those trials a different purpose altogether from what God planned for him to have, to start with. And um, then in turn, so being so resistant to God's plans, he actually made other plans for himself and took him that and he took himself out of the school the school room of those trials and difficulties. So was David fighting against God unwittingly at this point of time? Yes. Right? He was. Now let's let's summarize the, the problem as follows. Number one, Jacob did not know he was fighting against Christ. Number one, again, David did not know that it was God who was letting, letting these trials come to him for a very, very definite purpose. So he did not know it was the work of God to put him through the school of trial and difficulty. The same as Jacob didn't know it. And just as Jacob resisted the um, presence of Jesus without knowing he was fighting against God, so David by making his own plans to escape from the school of trial and difficulty was actually at war with God or fighting against God. Now then, as I said during the last study period, is it not true today that we still tend to regard trials as enemies? Don't we? Don't we, don't we tend to think that we should always be absolutely healthy, radiantly healthy, have no, no financial problems, and, um, and um, everything should be going along perfectly God is our problem solver so everything is just taken care of and we just go through life as if uh, we were on a, on, a, on a magic carpet so to speak but the facts are as Sister White says message to young people page uh, 63 those who are finally victorious will have seasons of terrible perplexity and trial in their religious experience or religious life but they must not cast away their confidence for this is a part of their discipline in the school of Christ and it is essential in order that, that all dross may be purged away. The servant of God must endure with fortitude the, tr the attacks of the enemy, his grievous taunts, and must overcome the obstacle which Satan will place in his way. Satan must seek to discourage the followers of Christ so they may not pray or study the scriptures and he will throw his hateful shadow athwart the path to hide Jesus from their view to shut away the vision of his love and the glories, glories of the heavenly inheritance. It is his delight to cause the children of God to go shrinkingly, tremblingly and painfully along under continual doubt. He seeks to make the pathway so sorrowful as possible, I mean as sorrowful as possible. But if you keep looking up, not down at your difficulties, you will not faint in the way and you will soon see Jesus reaching his hand to help you and you'll only have to give him your hand in simple confidence and let him lead you. As you become trustful, you will become hopeful. As you become trustful, then what? You will become hopeful. Now, <clears throat> let's face the fact that Jacob's trouble is going to be now Sunday afternoon, picking as I said before, is going to be a crucible in which we shall have separated from us the last traces of dross and therefore the last traces of earthliness the last residues of our sympathy together with Satan and from that we should come forth that people so perfected that God for us will be able to give that last convincing revelation of his character. Now I'll read to you now a statement which says that when we come to the end of the loud cry period we will then be ready for translation at that point 
but not yet ready to give the final revelation of God's character. Let's read first of all the statement which says that we'll be ready for translation. It's found in the book Great Controversy where um, on page 425 we read these words in regard to Christ's work in the most holy place as the refiner and purifier of silver. And the Advent folk thought that when they had um, experienced the work of the first apartment that they were ready for translation. The Sister White says this coming, page 424 in the book Great Controversy, page 424, this coming is foretold also by the prophet Malachi. And then it's quoted Malachi 3 verse 1 which we read in our last study period. I shall continue, oh I shall read it again. The coming of the Lord to his temple was sudden, unexpected to his people. They were not looking for him there. They expected him to come to earth in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. But the people were not yet ready to meet their Lord. There was still a work of preparation to be accomplished for them. Light was to be given, directing their minds to the temple of God in heaven, and as they should by faith follow their high priest and his ministration there, new duties would be revealed. Another message of warning and instruction would be given to the church says the prophet who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth for he is like a refiner's fire and like full of soap and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver he shall purify the sons of Levi and purse them as gold and silver that they may offer an offering uh, be pardon, they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness Malachi 3 verses 2 and 3 those who are living upon the earth and the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above and stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless, their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification of putting away of sin among God's people upon the earth. This work is more clearly presented in the message of Revelation 14. When this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. Right? Now, that work of purification is done from the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Right? That work of purification. And when that work is complete, then his followers or the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing, but not yet ready to give that full and final revelation of God's character. The ministry of the fifth angel's movement by which the power of Satan will finally and completely be broken. So beyond that work of purification, there's still a further work of purif purification yet necessary. Now during that period, we, we, we will finally come to the place, or first of all, during that period, we shall be subjected to fearful trials, trials of which we at the present time have no concept, dreadful trials. It will be a test which will search us out to the very limits. Now in order to successfully endure those trials then, we've got to have some hardening or some practice in the meantime. Now it's all very well for us to sit here today and listen to these things in theory, but I know from my own personal experience, let, let, me, let me talk about flying for instance, when the instructor takes you up, he says, okay, now I don't want to teach you this, and on the ground he'll run you through the whole thing. He doesn't then say, okay, now take the plane and do it, does he? He goes up with you, and he makes you do it a number of times, and when you've reached a certain degree of proficiency, he says, all right, now you go off and do it 10 or 15 times, and that practice that you then get is what enables you to do that thing now by habit. It's now become a built-in skill. Now likewise, how can we possibly endure the tremendous trials of Jacob's trouble if we today don't get some practice in this kind of thing? How can we? It's impossible. So therefore, from this day on, when God puts us in the school of affliction, and as I read before, um, those who are finally victorious will have seasons of terrible perplexity and trial in their religious life, but they must not cast away their confidence, for this is a part of their discipline, in the school of Christ and it is essential in order that all dross may be purged away. So when trials and persecutions come from this time on this say wonderful now I'm going to have a practice session today I'm going, I'm going to learn what I otherwise couldn't possibly learn 
God's allowed this thing to come upon me and I'm going to rejoice now in letting him work it out his way and above all else the spirit of submission is what God is seeking to develop a spirit of concert or concord with him so that as he allows the trial to come we don't resist that work we don't begin to to uh, complain and long for the trial to pass but we say this trial is sent for my good for my blessing for my education and I rejoice in the work which God is doing now those of course who learn to practice this way are the ones who are going to have the least trial and burden during Jacob's trouble in fact if we go so far to reperfect this experience we'll sleep in the bottom of the boat while all the rest are struggling and having a bad time around about us the same as Christ stepped in the bottom of the boat um, during that terrible storm well at the same time we must admit that during Jacob's I mean during the Garden of Gethsemane experience Christ certainly went through a fearful battle during that period of time when his submission to God was tested to the to the limit and he almost he almost gave up and went back to his father in heaven now Jesus Christ after the experience on the matter of temptation when he fasted for 40 days could maintain his submission there was after all that heavy practice that he got during those 33 and a half years of preparation and then of ministry could come to the place where he almost succumbed then how how much we should be hardened as soldiers in Christ's army to, to, to be able to endure trials and persecutions so that earthliness no longer is a matter of concern to us and to be no longer concerned about food upon our tables as being the most important thing or even saving our lives as being the most important thing I'd like to read the statement from the book Desire of Ages in regard to those who will stand nearest to the kingdom and this is the spirit that God is seeking to develop amongst every one of his, of his followers at this point of time the chapter is called The Law of the New Kingdom and it comes to us somewhere about page 500 and uh, see if I can find it here I've just forgotten the page number, about page 530 thereabouts And in this particular chapter, the Lord tells us, or, or we're told very plainly, just um, page 549, page 549. Now, this was this uh, uh, chapter is a comment upon the request made by the mother of James and John that their boy, her boy, should be the chief in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And Christ made it very clear that position in God's kingdom is not given by arbitrary gift, but it is given as a result of character and um, the paragraph now says the one who stands nearest to Christ will be he who on earth has drunk most deeply of the spirit of his, of his self-sacrificing love love that wanteth not itself is not puffed up seeketh not her own is not easily provoked thinketh no evil love that moves a disciple as it moved our Lord to give all to live and labour and sacrifice even unto death for the saving of humanity in other words the, 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 the principle of service for it becomes far more important than the preservation of one's own life this spirit was made manifest in the life of Paul he said for me to live is Christ for his life revealed Christ to men and to die is gain gain to Christ death itself would make manifest the power of his grace and gather souls to him Christ should be magnified in my body he said whether it be by life or by death now there's, there are just one or two of course we recognize the fact that every kind of wind of doctrine is blowing today men and women are rising up in various parts of the earth to proclaim a message which they have searched out and believe is the great truth of God for this time and among these various theologies is one which teaches that um, it was God never intended that any believer should ever die never that Enoch and Elijah are examples of what every Christian could have experienced and this particular theology uh, criticizes Job and says Job had to be a very sinful man to suffer as he did which of course is to echo the same accusations as Job's friends leveled against him and this particular theology is obviously a very pleasing one a very attractive one because our humanity or our earthliness loves to escape from death and suffering isn't that right? And what doctrine could be more pleasing to our flesh than that doctrine which says that you don't ever have to die. You can all just develop faith and perfection of character. And if you only believe in the promise of God, then you can be translated as Enoch was. Now, what, that's a very nice, attractive teaching, isn't it? But 
is one which appeals to earthliness and to humanity, not to the great principle of self-sacrificing love. Now, when on the other hand, the holiness of Christ becomes manifest in our lives and His love becomes our love and His Spirit becomes our spirit and we have the spirit of self-sacrificing love and the spirit of obedience, and as the statement says, the one who stands nearest to Christ will be he who on earth has drunk most deeply of the spirit of his self-sacrificing love. Now during this week, of course, we've been emphasizing the word spirit, haven't we? The spirit of obedience, the spirit of disobedience. They are the, um, and now we read about the spirit of self-sacrificing love. Then comes a dash. Love that vaunted not itself is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, and thinketh no evil. Love that moves the disciple as it moved our Lord to give all, to live and labor and sacrifice even unto death for the saving of humanity. Now, is it an easy thing for you to die for somebody else? That's hard, isn't it? I mean, our humanity really rejects that idea. It's something that we find, uh, find very pleasant. I think I'd have to confess that I'm quite happy to sacrifice for you if I got to a point. <laughs> <laughs> But to give my life now, that might be something else. When, when the time came, I, I, I guess I'd submit to it, but uh, I certainly wouldn't jump into the idea. <laughs> and that's humanity speaking, isn't it? That's earthliness crying out and objecting to what, uh, what God may call us to do. But divine love in the person moves us to sacrifice even unto death for the saving of humanity. Now, Paul had that spirit. It was manifest in his life. And as a witness to that, he said, for me to live is Christ, for his life revealed Christ to men, and to die is gain. To live, I live for Christ, or to die is gain. Gain to Christ. Death itself will make manifest the power of his grace and gather souls to him. Christ shall be magnified in my body, he said, whether it be by life or by death. And the theology to which I've just made reference, of course, says that God is never really, he's only honored by the death of Christians in a kind of a, uh, in a salvage as, when God just salvages the best out of a bad situation that's their, that's their theology it's a, it's a salvage operation whereas God would be far better glorified if the person was not to die but to live forever I'd like to go back to um, another statement in the same book Desire of Ages this one deals with the um, statement by Christ if any man will come after me let him take up his cross and follow me it's in the chapter the um, Hmm. page 416 I believe it to be what I'm looking for page 416 right the foreshadowing of the cross page 416 to page 417 and here's an explanation of, of Christ's words if any man will come after me let, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me and having said those words Sister White says or by saying those words Sister White says Jesus now explained to his disciples that his own life of self-abnegation was an example of what there should be. Now, self-abnegation is submission. Isn't that right? It involves submission. Submission to whatever God may design we shall have. Calling about him with, it, with the disciples, the people who had been lingering near, he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, there are two crosses, of course. There's the Roman cross, which the Romans used to persecute others, and there's the Christian cross, which is a symbol of our self-sacrifice. Sister White now describes the cross as it was understood by the folk back in those days. The cross was associated with the power of Rome. It is the instrument of the most cruel and humiliating form of death. The lowest criminals were required to bear the cross to the place of ex execution, and often as it was about to be laid upon their shoulders, they, they resisted with desperate violence until they were overpowered and the instrument of torture was bound upon them. All right, now there's one picture of human attitude towards suffering or to the cross, the cross of Calvary. And when a person in whom there is no trace of the power of Jesus Christ present, a person who is an unholy person, a person who does not know what submission, obedience and faith are, when that person is taken to the cross because of his own sins, he resists it with all his power. He fights against it. But the contrast lies in the Christian experience, as we read on page 417, but, and that word but means contrast, 
but Jesus bade his disciples take up the cross and bear it after him don't fight it accept it don't push it away draw it to you so the disciples his words they are dimly comprehended pointed to their submission note that word again to their submission to the most bitter humiliation submission even to death for the sake of Christ no more complete self-surrender could the Saviour's words have pictured but all this all this he had accepted for them and don't overlook the statement I've just read that Christ's words pointed to their submission to the most bitter humiliation submission even unto death for the sake of Christ now should a Christian then be seeking a, a way to heaven that uh, avoids his own death if that's what's, what's required no he shouldn't like John the Baptist we should say that we surrender ourselves to God for life or for death as should whichever should best serve the cause we love life or death as the case may be no more complete self-surrender could the Saviour's words have pictured but all this he had accepted for them Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost he left the heavenly courts for a life of reproach and insult and a death of shame he who is rich in heaven's priceless treasure became poor that through his poverty we might be rich we are to follow in the path he trod back on page 20 yes page 20 of the same book Desire of Ages where they're told that the law of self-sacrificing love is the law of life for heaven and earth and during Jacob's trouble because of the trials that we shall go through at that point of time we shall be brought to the place where we really have that character of God developed in us to its fullest possible extent so we, we reflect the image of Jesus faultlessly perfectly spotlessly and fully at last and when that time comes then the final victory shall be gained now remember that Jacob wrestled till the break of day and it was indeed not just the break of a physical new day it was also the, break, the beginning of a great new day so far as his life experience was concerned and when Jacob got that victory when he got that victory then at that point of time God revealed to Esau in a dream the real character of his brother now up until that time in what light alone did Esau see Jacob he saw him as a threat to him didn't he right as a threat as a danger to him he thought of him, thought of him only as a a um, um, what's the word I wonder supplanter a usurper a robber a thief and that's the only picture in which you can see Jacob and he thought now that, that cunning scoundrel is coming back again to take all my birthright possessions from him but he's not going to do it not of my dead body he won't do it but when when um, Esau was given a dream that night Esau saw the real character of Jacob he saw he was not a supplanter not a robber or a thief he was not coming back as a threat to Jacob but in fact he's come back as a blessing to Esau I shouldn't say to Jacob, to Esau he's coming as a blessing to Esau and when Esau saw the real character of Jacob from that point of time on forever he had no more concern uh, or in no more desire I should say to take the life of his brother he lost all interest in Jacob altogether didn't he from that point of time on and the same thing is going to happen when down at the end of time the people of God gain the final victory and the eyes of the wicked are opened and they see for themselves the real character of God's law the real character of the Lord whom they have fought against and they'll lose all interest in coming God's folk from that point of time on instead they'll bow at their feet and say well you are the ones whom God has loved after all and we can now understand how you tried so hard to save us from our foolish mistakes how you tried to save us from being our own plan makers and problem solvers. We, we wouldn't listen and our troubles are all brought upon our own heads you are not to blame for them when that time comes of course the wicked will then turn upon each other and never again before the second coming of Jesus Christ will they try and destroy the righteous people of God now when I was at the German camp meeting we had given a study I given a study on the experience of Jacob and uh, at the end of it the question was put to me what means this fight between Jacob and Jesus Christ does this not point to the end of type where the same thing is going to happen with the people of God in the last days in what way are we fighting against God I said I never thought about that before and I hadn't either but as I thought about it the, the answer opened up before my mind and as I saw that it's going to take the work of revival which we already experienced 
and the work of reformation which is going on today and this this fairly comprehensive education that God is giving to us in respect to the Sabbath rest principles is going to take all the flood tide glory of the loud cry period and the persecution associated therewith and it's going to take the agony of Jacob's trouble to finally root out of our systems that deeply embedded uh, instinct or disposition disposition is a better word that deeply embedded disposition to make the saving of our lives a paramount thing to be our own plan makers and problem solvers and it's going to take all that to get that wickedness out of our system and how deep and how subtle that wickedness is you think about it and that really impressed my mind with the great work which, which, yet, which yet lies before God's people before Jesus Christ will be able to come and take us home to be with him in the last days now inasmuch as the experience to be developed is the experience of holiness that is a spirit of total submissive obedience and trusting faith a faith which trusts God no matter what the pressure may be and obedience which will not be um, sacrificed no matter how trying the circumstances will be upon us now when we recognize how, um, how we need to be a holy people at that time and when we remember that the definition of obedience and of trusting faith is uh, so badly misunderstood because people think that when they observe the seventh day of the week as a Sabbath day when they pay a faithful tithes and offerings when they go to church every Sabbath when they do all these things when they feed the poor and clothe the naked and so forth when they manifest their own righteousness and obedience to God's commandments they think they're being obedient right but we have learned that there is a, a more precise meaning to obedience than what we have taught in the past we have learned for instance that we're in this world purely and only to manifest God's righteous, righteousness to be his instruments for the revelation of his character we're not here to manifest our own righteousness and therefore as Jesus turned away from those suffering thousands to die upon the cross of Calvary so we too at times must do the same and um, obedience means doing the will of God as God reveals that will from day to day without trying to conjecture as to what the success or failure of that work might be it means trusting him in darkness as well as in the light and therefore in order to understand precisely what our obedience is and precisely what faith is what do we need? we need an example we need somebody who has lived that life before and by the study of that life learn ourselves exactly what the obedience is that God wants and the faith that God wants and who then is that example? Jesus Christ. Now can you begin to better now can you begin to better appreciate why before the Philadelphian people who are, to, who are going to go through this experience when they have to manifest impeccable obedience and perfect faith, can you begin to appreciate the reason why Christ is presented to that people as he that is holy? See the point? That's what this church needs more than anything else an example of what holiness is and who better can give that witness than Christ himself he is the perfect example of holiness for this reason then what should be our field of study throughout the rest of our lives not just the rest of this year but the rest of our lives the study of the life of Christ in the particular context of holiness in other words ask yourself the question now here is Christ in a given situation on the mountaintop, on the temple top viewing all the nations of the world as they went by and hearing Satan say if you're bound and worship me I'll give you all this see him in the boat see him preaching the multitude see him being persecuted and crucified and, and, and rising again in each and every one of those experiences we are to ask ourselves the question what was the pressure upon Jesus Christ in this experience to, to make his own plans and go his own way and how did Christ relate himself to the situation what did he do in the situation which is a perfect exemplification of obedience and submission and faith and then we'll know that what Christ did in that particular situation we are to do in the same kind of situation and if we stay the life of Christ within, within those terms of reference as the holy one as the obedient and believing one then what better training could we get for our for our future trials and tribulations than that is there any better? none better that's exactly the education we need 
and therefore the presentation of Jesus Christ as the Holy One to the Philadelphian church is the most needed presentation they could ever have or ever need in their preparation for the coming conflict. Now I trust that you all catch that point and catch it well. Let's just go back to Revelation chapter 3 again to, um, to make sure the point is, is coming through quite clearly and strongly. In Revelation chapter 3, we find the message beginning in verse 7 to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Now we've proved, I think, to everyone's satisfaction that the Philadelphian church is that body of people through whom God will finally reveal the perfection of his character and cause the wicked world to recognize and to acknowledge that God is right and true and that they have been entirely wrong. They'll be led to admit that all their sufferings are the fruit of their own doings and as they're divorced from their misrepresentations of God's character, the way is open for Christ to return to this earth. That is the Philadelphian church, it is the church of final victory, of final triumph, the final instrument through whom God will finish his work and usher in the glories of eternity. Now in order to do that work, they must be a qualified people, right? They must be qualified. And the qualifications supremely are holiness, which is obedience and faith. Those two things that we read in Christ Obedience Lessons, page 51, to obey and to believe makes a person to be an holy person. Now, inasmuch as, of course, um, the obedience required is a very particular obedience, not just a general obedience, as we've been learning, of course, in the Sabbath rest message, it means following God's ways in every particular, it means total submission to his will, it means total confidence in his commands and his protecting care and, and guidance and so forth, then the Philadelphia, those, will, those will aspire and finally reach the standard of the Philadelphian church must go through a very thorough, lengthy and intensive period of preparation, during which they will learn by experience as well as by studying the example of Christ just exactly how to live a holy life or a life of obedience and trust. And therefore, that being so, we find that before that church is presented the Saviour in this role, these things that he that is holy. Here is one who has achieved that perfection, who has lived a perfectly obedient life, who had never let go of his faith at any, any price whatsoever, and therefore the study of that life within the terms of reference of what holiness is is the most important study we could ever engage in at the present time. And I hope you can see that. And um, because um, I'd like to read a statement now, page 761 again in the book Desire of Ages, no, 7, maybe 7759 perhaps. No, it's page, seven, page 761 is correct in the book Desire of Ages. Could one sin have been found in Christ had he in one particular yielded to Satan to escape the terrible torture, the enemy of God and man would have triumphed. Christ bowed his head and died, but... Now here's a, here's a magnificent sentence. He bowed his head and died, but he held fast his faith and his submission to God. So which was more important to Christ? Obedience or life? Obedience, Obedience right? He held fast his faith, he clung to it, he never let it go, he never retro retrograded, he never apostatized, he never fell by the wayside. But that, that submission and faith, and of course submission is obedience, his faith in God and his submission to God, obedience to God, he never ever let that go, even though clinging to it cost him his life. Now obviously of course such a life in which there was, but we, don't, we never have to say in regard to the life of Christ, well, you know, over here Christ did the wrong thing, so we, we, that lesson is a negative one. He did the right thing, that's a positive one. Whereas, of course, when we go back to the lives of great men like Jacob or Moses, Abraham or David, then we, we have to categorize their, their life's actions in two different classes. One, a successful adherence to God's uh, commandments and principles and ways. The other, of course, an unsuccessful stand. Victories on one side and defeats upon the other side. And we have to learn one lesson in both a negative and a positive fashion. But with the life of Christ, every single action, every single relationship he ever had to the principles of uh, righteousness was always right, and therefore we can trust Christ's example to be the perfect one to follow, 
no matter what the situation may be. Now I propose now for the rest of this camp meeting to take up the book Desire of Ages principally and spend our time tracing through from, from experience to experience the life of Jesus Christ within, the, within these terms of reference. We're looking, looking at his life from only one point of view. How did he manifest holiness? How was he obedient? What did he do to be obedient? What might he have done which would seem like obedience? And how did he maintain his faith through this period of trial and stress? That will now be the subject of the rest of our camp meeting. In other words, an exploration of the terms, He that is holy. We did this at the Californian camp and it proved to be a very inspirational and blessed exercise. And we'll start you on the pathway for the rest of the book because most certainly we'll not cover the entire book, Desire of Ages, and the four Gospels in one little camp meeting. That would be too much to expect altogether, wouldn't it? But it certainly will get us started in the right direction, and I trust that you will then continue the same study during the, months, the coming months of this year, either, either collectively or individually or both, certainly individually, and let's hope maybe collectively too in your Sabbath school lessons, and um, you find this to be a very, very powerful and wonderful inspiration, and certainly an education in how to manifest the principles of holiness no matter what the situation may be. So let's start it now. We have about seven minutes left for the study period. So let's uh, start with chapter 1 and page 19 in the book Desire of Ages. Now bear in mind that God never asks us to be or do anything which he himself not, uh, is not already. God is holy. There are many statements in the Old Testament in particular which say that. <clears throat> God said to Israel, for instance, Be holy as I am holy. So God himself is submissively obedient to the great principles of righteousness. And God, of course, has implicit faith in the system of which he is in command. And he asks us to, and he has great faith in us as well. Not that we deserve it, but he does just the same. So God then through Jesus Christ is an example of what we are to be in all situations. Now the first chapter is called God with us. His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. And God with us being of course the meaning of the word Emmanuel. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From the days of eternity the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father he was the image of God, the image of his greatness and majesty, the outshining of his glory. It was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. To the sin darkened earth he came to reveal the light of God's love to be God with us. Therefore it was prophesied of him, his name shall be called Emmanuel. Now I don't plan to spend a great deal of time in chapter 1. I want to get into the actual life story of Jesus Christ as a child, as a youth, as a man. Some chapters are omit altogether, such as the fullness of time, probably. But this first paragraph makes it very plain that Jesus Christ came to this, this world for a very, very express purpose. And that express purpose was to be what? The revelation of the character of God, the ways of God, because the ways of God are the, reflection, are the revelation of the character of God. And therefore, if we would be like God, possess his humility, possess his submission, possess his faith and purity, then of course Jesus Christ is the lesson book from which we are to read those, those uh, principles and to understand exactly how to follow because Christ not only declared the character of God, he also demonstrated the character of God and he was literally God with us. For which reason of course he could say to his disciples, if you've seen me then what? You have seen the Father, John chapter 14. A little further now, by coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. He was the word of God, God's thought made audible. In his prayer for his disciples he says, I have declared unto them thy name, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. But not alone for his earth-born children was this, was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, and it will be their study throughout endless ages. Both the redeemed and the unformed beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. Now, why do we have these two words, science and song? What, first of all, is their science? 
as distinct from their song. Well, first, what's their song? Their experience. Yes, their experience, right. But it's, it's the expression. Their song is the expression of complete recognition of and appreciation of and admiration for the cross and the way of the cross. Now, the science of the cross is procedure. Science is procedure. It's the way of doing things. So, in other words, the cross will be their way of life and it will be a way of life that will not be a, a boredom or a tedium to them but it will be a way of life which they will have the highest appreciation the great, from which they will gain the greatest enjoyment and satisfaction and they will recognize that there is no other way but the way of the cross it's the only way to live a life of obedience and faith a life of self-sacrifice a life of loving service to others so they will find in the cross their science and their song it will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is a glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven, that the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God, and that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwelt in the light which no man can approach unto. And next, the rest of the chapter goes on then to talk about first of all the fact that this very character of God was manifested in the glorious created works of God in the heavens and down upon this earth the fact that sin has marred God's perfect work has not, de uh, not destroyed the lesson book of nature and then the angels are also a manifestation of God's character of love and I've learned to really appreciate the angels of late as I see that they are working tirelessly to bring us to a level of perfection and a position which is even higher than that which they themselves can ever know and to a fellowship with Christ which is even closer than that that they which can ever know. Christ of course is then revealed as the supreme revelation of God's character but then comes the revelation of Satan who has destroyed God's, God's message by bringing in a misrepresentation of God's character and that Jesus Christ then came down to this earth to live as a man among men to show us the way to live pitching his tent by the side of the tents of men um, bearing the weaknesses and failures of our humanity and in this capacity giving to us a complete and marvellous demonstration of what holiness really is and the ultimate result of course is that uh, the plan of redemption will be complete I'll read the last paragraph on page 26 of this chapter the work of redemption will be complete in the place where sin abounded, Christ's grace much more abounds. The earth itself, the very field that Satan claims as his, is to, be, is to be not only ransomed but exalted. Our little world, under the curse of sin, and the, and, under the curse of sin, the one dark blot in his glorious creation will be honoured above all other worlds in the universe of God. Here, where the Son of God tabernacled in humanity, where the King of glory lived and suffered and died, here, when he shall make all things new, the tabernacle of God shall be with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And through endless ages, as the redeemed walk in the light of the Lord, they will praise him for his unspeakable gift, God with us. And my time has gone for this particular study period. So we'll stop at this point and uh, pick up the thread when we come back for our next study period in a little while. I promised that uh, we wait till about five o'clock so that um, your son could come. Is he here yet? No. Okay, so, so let's... Um, it's now 20 past four. We could start in 15 minutes. Let's wait at least till... Well, if we turn up early, we'll start early, but we'll say five o'clock anyway at the latest. Pardon? At the end of the next study, but you can sing now if you want to. Do you want to sing now? <laughs> you know, like we do in the evening. Oh, yeah, well, that's why we didn't have... Yes, well, why not? Okay, okay, good.